Welcome to Lecture 14a, entitled Double Integrals in Polar Coordinates. The material for this lecture comes from sex, Section 16.3 of the text. The objectives here are to develop the tools for sketching and computing double integrals in polar coordinates, and the concepts and visualization skills that we basically master, having gone through this teaching module, are what do we mean by the integration bounds for radius r and angle theta, the visualization of bounding curves or lines in polar coordinates, and the differential area in polar coordinates. As usual, the second slide is just a review of the slides to follow, so we'll just skip over this one. All right, so we'll start with the theorem for integration of double integrals in polar coordinates over polar rectangle regions. And so this is basically, again, going to be a Riemann sum but this Riemann sum now is in terms of different coordinates. And so expression, although looking similar, the details will be a little bit different. So for example, if we're dealing with a function f, which has units of meters, and you're multiplying by an area, you're computing a volume. So if you take the sum of differential volume elements, sum them together, then in the limit, as the number of volume elements increases, and each volume element gets smaller, that, that can be converted into a double integral. And so effectively you end up with a function f, evaluate x and y, where x and y are now basically replaced by co r cos theta r sine theta, and the area basically becomes the uh, differential area in polar coordinates, which is r d r d theta. And the units, of course, of f r cos theta r sine theta will be meters, otherwise this would not have units of, would not have units of, um, of uh, cubic meters. Uh, so delta area basically is uh, shown. This is a differential area, de de delta volume uh, for ind individual uh, volume element is shown as well. And again, the sums are typically done when you're looking at what happens in a computer or instrumentation. All right, so the theorem itself, change of variables for double integrals over polar rectangle regions. Uh, it's, it assumes that f is continuous in the region R in the xy plane and expressed in polar coordinates as the region basically would be from 0 less than or equal to a, so a has got to be greater than 0, is less than or equal to r is less than or equal to b. So there's an upper bound and lower bound on r. And alpha is less than or equal to theta is less than or equal to beta. But the difference between beta and alpha should be less than or equal to 2 pi so that you basically do not sweep around a circle more than once. So if these conditions are satisfied, then f is integral over r, and the double integral of f over r is just what you see stated below. All right, so. so let's look at just geometrically a little bit more into this. We talked about this sort of more of a theoretical point of view, but this is perhaps a little bit easier to visualize now. So if we're dealing with polar coordinates, we're dealing with radial lines and circumferential lines. So the unit vectors in the, uh, in the uh, transform system would be in this direction and this direction. And again, because it's a right-handed coordinate system, the theta direction or theta hat direction would be pointing always into a counterclockwise direction. So something in this direction is getting larger, something in this direction is getting larger. So if we were to basically just draw this out in terms of a series of patches, Right, then this is what the differential area would look like for this uh, segment K, subscript K right here. And so you would be evaluating this at some position here, which in terms of polar coordinates would be at a certain radius and a certain theta. Right, so A less than or equal to R less than or equal to B, what does that mean? Well, this would be R equals A and this would be R equals B. So you'd basically be looking going from here all the way over to here. Alpha less than or equal to theta is less than to beta. The angle alpha would be this angle here, and the angle beta would be this one. So we'd be looking at everything between this line and this line, and everything between this line and this line. So this is essentially the region when we write things out in this fashion here. If you want to look at this in a little bit more detail in terms of you know what this differential area is, because it's uh, polar coordinates are an orthogonal coordinate system. That means that this corner piece here, these should be, will be uh, basically vectors that are 90 degrees displaced with respect to each other. 
And in the limit, this just becomes a rectangular object when you make it very, very small. So this is because it's an orthogonal system that we, we have this. So if you take this as delta r, and you take this as uh, uh, r delta theta, r k delta r delta theta, right? then this times this basically gives you uh, the area. Right, so this is just another way of looking at it. Uh, mind you, this is a simple one. For more complex systems, it would be difficult to just write this out. So we would just stick to basically the mathematical procedure which we had developed earlier. All right, you want to look at an interactive demonstration of this, you can go to the, the link uh, and uh, you can play a little bit with it if you wish. All right, so simple examples, integration limits and polar coordinates. So if you're given a region look, that looks like this, from 0 to B, that basically means you're starting at a single point, and the radial line moves all the way out to this point. 0, theta less than pi over 2 means you start here, and you sweep out to here. So effectively, you're mapping out the quarter, quarter uh, circle, or the first quadrant. What about this case? 0 less than equal to R less than equal to B, alpha less than equal to theta less than equal to beta. Well, alpha would be some angle with respect to the x-axis. Beta would be some larger value with respect to x-axis. And 0 less than r equals b. Rb would be here. r equals 0 would be this point here. And so this is the region that's swept out if you describe a region in this form. If you describe a region in this form, then you're going between an inner value of r of a and an outer value of b, which means you're going from this point to this point. And theta in this case from alpha beta would mean alpha is this angle and beta would be that angle. So this is the region that you'd see if you were to write the region out in this form. Uh, if you want to again look at an interactive version of what we've just described then you can go to the, the URL that's mentioned on this page. So in the previous slides we looked at integration bounds in polar coordinates where the bounds were just uh, constants, so constants for the radius and constants for the angle. Here we're going to look at integration bounds and polar coordinates for the general case. So in the general case, we'll always end up having that the outer bounds are between constant angles, but now the inner bound is basically going to be a function of the angle theta, that is, the radial radius is going to be a function of theta. And so this in short form would look like this. So let's look at this. You'll notice that h of theta, the actual radius, depends on the angle theta. And h of theta being the larger of the two is going to be the upper bound. g of theta will be the lower bound. And the angle of theta will range between alpha on the low and beta on the high end. Again, this is taken as the direction of increasing theta. Therefore, this one will be the upper boundary and this will be the lower boundary and so the region basically would be written in this form all right if you want to look at this in more detail then uh, you uh, can uh, uh, look at this uh, interactive version if you wish uh, maybe help you know, understand certain things a bit, little bit better all right so let's work through an example problem um, you're given a problem statement, find the volume bounded by the paraboloid, z equals 9 minus x squared minus y squared, and the xy plane, which is z equals 0. So the boundary for the region of integration is defined by the intersection of the paraboloid and the xy plane, which means that you let z equals 0, which equals 9 minus x squared minus y squared. And if you write that out, that just is just the equation of a circle with radius 3. So the region basically will have this form here. Now, if you put this in Cartesian form in terms of an integration, f of x, y, z, right, uh, and uh, you look at the bounds of the circle, then you find that half of the region that is a function of y would be the square root of 9 minus x squared, and the bottom half would be minus square root 9 minus x squared. And the argument of this basically uh, is greater than or equal to 0 between the values of x minus 3 and positive 3. So this becomes the limits, uh, the bound limits for, for the value of x. So this is essentially the volume written out uh, in terms of the um, uh, uh, in terms of Cartesian coordinates. All right. So this is basically then uh, the starting point. 
So um, we're going to use a transformation equation, uh, equations which are for polar coordinates. So x equals r cos theta, y equals r sine theta. And this is basically as a set of circular regions. So r will be equal to 3, th 3 and theta will be from 0 to 2 pi to map out this region, which is equivalent to the region that you see here written in Cartesian form. So this is basically uh, the starting point. Okay, so uh, next step. All right, so we've got to we've got to compute the um, we've done the the bounds, and now we have to need the differential area. Well, we were given the transformation, and so we can compute basically the Jacobian matrix dx dr dx d theta for the first row, dy by dr dy d theta for the second row, and so if you take the determinant, you end up with a value of r. Uh, so that means dy dx in the original Cartesian coordinate system transforms to r dr d theta in polar coordinates. Now the integrand basically had this form, right? And so if you want to now transform this into polar coordinates, you make use of the transformation variables. X is r equals sine theta, y equals r sine theta. Make the substitutions, which I've done here, and then bring out r squared as a common factor, and then the sum of these two would be equal to 1. And so this becomes 9 minus r squared. So now we can take the original equation now and basically transform it into polar coordinates. So the radius goes from 0 to 3, and you go once around the circle to map out the circle, 0 to 2 pi. This got transformed into 9 minus r squared, and dy dx got transformed into r dr d theta. Now, be very careful, because you get this additional r factor, and you may forget about it when you do the integral. So always try to make sure that the r is placed right next to the, in, the integrand, which has been transformed into polar coordinates, so you don't make a mistake and, and neglect this r factor here. Anyway, if you integrate with respect to r, you hold theta constant. And finally, the last integral with respect to theta will end up giving you 81 pi over 2 and units of cubic meters because we're computing a, a volume. Now you'll notice I basically eliminated the, the absolute value sign because with polar coordinates, we have a right-handed coordinate system. Right, and because of that, we know that the Jacobian, the determinant of the Jacobian will always be positive. So there's no need to use the absolute sign, absolute value sign. All right, this is sort of interesting now because you really would like to know well, what would the mapping look like when you go from region, from region R to region S or back in, in the opposite direction. So let's start over here because it's the easier one. We know basically that we're going from R equals zero to R equals three and that theta is equal to a zero in this case. Then we hold r fixed, and we go from zero to two pi, right? Then we hold it at two pi, and basically bring r back to zero, and then finally here we hold r fixed at zero and come all the way back. So this is region S, right, uh, in terms of uh, the UV plane. In this case, we just call it the theta r plane. So how does this actually look like in terms of when we transform to the region R, which is the xy plane. Well, let's look here. We'd have to use the transformation equations. So if you're going along here, basically, you're going from theta equals 0, but R from 0 to 3, which means you're going from here to there, which is labeled as A prime. When you go from 3, 0, pi, to keeping the radius fixed, 3, to 2 pi, you're basically going around the circle, and you're coming fully all the way around. All right, so that basically deals with this one. What about this one here? This is C. You're basically holding, in this case, um, theta 2 pi, and you're going from r equals 3 to 0, which means you're tracing back to the origin, which is the C prime. And finally, when you go from here to here, what are you actually doing? Basically, you're holding r equal to 0. r equals 0 would be actually the origin, okay? That would be the origin. And you're just multiply making points on the origin until you get back to here. So what have you actually done here? You basically traced out a line that goes all the way around, comes back, and comes back again. So you've formed a closed circle. The fact that these two lines are on top of each other doesn't, ma doesn't matter because we mentioned before that we're only interested in the mapping within the interior to be one-to-one. -one. So whatever happens on this boundary is irrelevant. But you can see, having gone around that circle, we've actually swept out this whole region. 
All right, so it's rather interesting to see what this contour really looks like. All right, there's an interactive version that you can look at uh, and for the case where we're dealing only in Cartesian coordinates. And then, if you wish, you can also look at what it looks like in polar coordinates. All right, so that concludes Lecture 14a. Uh, thank you for listening.